page 187 continued para we can also get some idea of the extent of the donated land in Baghel Khan held by the various branches of the Kalachuris from the middle of the 10th to the end of the 12th century. Here, villages were mostly granted to Brahminas, presumably because of the need of having their support in maintaining control over a backward area. Most donations consisted of single villages, Footnote 34. Thus, a doni from Vaishali was granted a village by Karna 1041-73-35. But one inscription records the grant of five villages by the king and members of the royal family to eight brahmanas probably associated with the temple of Vishnu in a city. 36. An inscription of Yuvaraja Deva II informs us that his favorite wife, Nohala, granted two villages to a Shaiva ascetic and seven to the god Shiva, 37. Another grant of his, of his comprised probably 23, certainly 16 villages, 38. Land was also granted by the Sariyupara Gorakhpur branch of the Kalachuris and the grant made by Sodha, S-O-D-H-A-D-E-V-A-1135 to 14 Brahmana shows that the gift land measuring 20 Nalus was situated in six villages, 39. The charters of the Kalachuris of Tripuri and Ratanpur and of their feudatories show that altogether 65 villages were granted by them for religious purpose, although the number does not seem to have been as great as under the Chandelas. If, however, we place reliance upon a tradition recorded in an inscription, it would appear that a major part of the Kalachuri kingdom of Tripuri was given as a grant to a monastic establishment. According to it, Sadbha Shambhu, Sadbhava Shambhu of the Golaki, G-O-L-A-K-I Mata, received a gift of three lakhs of villages from the Kalachuri king, Yuvaraja I. This would account for one-third of the total revenue of his home province of Dahola, which, according to tradition, comprised nine lakhs of villages. 40. This may not be literally true, for the number of villages would not be as many as the tradition records. But, without doubt, the Kalachuris liberally patronize the Matas, 41, especially the Shaiva ones which emerged as intermediaries in land under the Kalachuris, similar to the Buddhist monasteries under Harsha and the Palas, Para. Malwa, the western part of central India held by the Parmaras in the 11th and 12th centuries, presented a somewhat different picture. Here the scions of the royal family, vassals and officials seem to have occupied a considerable portion of land. Page 188 We get the general impression that the major part of the donated land was managed by them rather than by the priests and temples. In the outlying areas of the Paramara kingdom, a feudatory seems to have held as many as 1,500 villages as reward for his services. The main reason which led to the division of Malwa and the neighboring areas into so many fiefs or personal estates was the tradition of equality among the members of the ruling clan who founded nearly half a dozen branches of the dynasty. Perhaps the major part of the Paramara dominions was divided into fiefs. Villages granted for religious purposes seemed to have been fewer and were mostly donated singly. 42. In addition to these, plots of land were also granted for this purpose. 43. Para. The inscriptions of the Chairmanas illustrate more clearly the parcelling out of villages among the scions of the royal family. 
In their territories in Rajasthan, the number of villages held by the temples, 44, and Brahmanas seem to be limited and certainly less than those held by the kinsmen of the royal family. Other vassals and officials, who of course met occasional grants of villages for religious purposes, para. Land was also granted for religious purposes, sometimes as Agraharas in the hill state of Chamba in the latter half of the 10th century and in the 11th century, 45. But here we do not hear of grants of villages. Perhaps on account of the scarcity of arable land, only plots of land were granted. Land grants were also enjoyed by secular assignees, 46, although it is difficult to get even a very rough indication of the extent of land held as gifts or fiefs, para. Whether through the fact that more land charters have survived from this period or whether because of the rise of more dynasties, undoubtedly in the two centuries preceding the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate, far more grants of villages in northern India are recorded than during nearly three centuries of the Pala and Pratihara rule down to AD 1000. Numerous villages were granted in Uttar Pradesh and Central India, which never witnessed so many gifts of villages under the Pratiharas. Indeed, during the 11th and 12th centuries, the practice of making land grants became almost universal, page 189, throughout the whole of northern India. The records of Malwa, Gujarat and Rajasthan give the impression that the major portion of land in these areas was held as fiefs by kinsmen, vassals and officials who were probably assigned more villages than priests and temples. But in Uttar Pradesh and Central India, more villages were held by priests than by secular assignees. The data from Bihar, Bengal and Assam are too slender to hazard any generalization, although it is fair to assume that monastic establishments of the type of Nalanda, which had been granted 200 villages, continued to flourish till the advent of the Muslim conquerors in this area. Para. A statistical account of the villages held in religious grounds or secular assignments is impossible. It is not possible even in the case of European countries, which are more fortunate in the possession of records. In northern India, even if all gift villages mentioned in inscriptions are totaled up, it will not be possible to determine their ratio to the total number of villages, for the total number is not known. Nevertheless, the land charters of the period provide unmistakable evidence of the widespread practice of religious and secular grants of villages for which several officers known as Mahasandhi Vikraha, Kama, Mahakash Patalika and Dharmalekhi were especially maintained in various kingdoms and of northern India. All this meant an increase in the number of intermediaries of different grades in land, which may be regarded as a significant feature of the economy of the period para. An important practice under the Palas and Pratiharas, 47, which enabled the beneficiaries to increase their personal demesne, D-E-M-E-S-N-E, but at the same time to extend the cultivable area at the cost of forest or barren land surrounding the donated village was to leave the boundaries of the gift villages undefined. So far as Eastern Bihar and Bengal are concerned, it seems that the practice continued in the 11th and 12th centuries under Mahipala the First, 988-103848, Vikrahapala the Third, 49, and Madanapala, 1140255, 50. The charters of these rulers grant the villages with their boundaries up to their pasture grounds and shrubs. 51. The custom of not specifying the boundaries was also followed by the Varmans, 52, and some other feudatories, 53, of the Palas in East Bengal. Even much later, the practice was continued by the Sena chiefs of PT near Gaya.
54, page 190, and by Sangrama Gupta, a ruler in South Monghair, sometime in the late 12th or the 13th century, 56. Although the term used in his charter was the four boundaries defined, Chatu, Sima, Vachina, 56, actually these were not stated, para. But the Senas who supplanted the Varmans in East Bengal and occupied a major part of the Pala kingdom in the 12th and early 13th centuries always took care to define the boundaries of villages and plots of land granted by them. 57. The same practice was followed by the Chandras, probably the contemporaries of the Senas in Bangladesh. The Mainamati copper plates of Ladha Chandra clearly specify the limits of the villages granted. 58. The fact that boundaries were defined and the areas and income specified would suggest that the progressive possibility of grants in opening new land to cultivation was exhausted. But this could hardly apply to contemporary Assam, where the limits of the plots of land and the yields from them were clearly mentioned. 59. Perhaps limits were specified in Assam because not villages but plots of land were given in donation. Whatever might be the reason, the specification of boundaries circumscribed the area to which the donees could extend his jurisdiction. Para. In contrast to Bangladesh under the Chandras and Senas, the villages granted by the Garhwalas and their feudatories in Uttar Pradesh generally did not have their boundaries defined. 60. The usual phrase used in this connection was, quote, the village up to its boundaries, unquote, comma, defined as to its four abatals, bracket, Chatur Aghata Vishuddha, bracket, close, 61. But actually only the Vasahi grant of Govinda Chandra defines the boundaries on all sides of a village given in Grant 62. Since most Kaharwala land grants seem to have been made in developed areas, it is strange that the boundaries are not mentioned. Perhaps these were taken for granted, but even then lack of specification may have given the beneficiary a free hand in extending his personal property. Para. But in the Kalachuri dominion of Baghil Khan, the village granted was never defined. Of 65 villages recorded as grants in the charters of the Kalachuris of Tripuri and Ratanpur and their feudatories, 63 None has its boundaries demarcated. Page 191. Many gift villages are just named and no details whatsoever furnished, particularly in the grounds made by the feudatories. All this seems to be understandable in view of the emigration of the Brahmanas from outside. 64. Mainly from Uttar Pradesh to Central India, which may have helped the growth of agriculture through the introduction of new methods, but hindered the development of the proprietary rights of the peasants in the donated villages. Para. What prevailed in the eastern part of Central India also obtained in its western part in Malwa, where the grants of the Parmaras generally do not mention the boundaries of the villages given. In one case, it is stated that the village extended up to a coast, KOS 65. But in other cases, even this is not stated, 66. However, they use the phrase, Swa hyphen Shima hyphen Trina hyphen Yuti, Yuti hyphen Gochara hyphen Padianta, bracket, extending up to its boundaries, comma, grassy land and pasture grounds bracket close, which is so common in Pala and other land charters. It seems that in Malwa there was still some scope for bringing virgin land under cultivation because Brahmanas from a large number of places outside Malwa were invited to settle in the land, 67. But it is likely that many of these were brought rather to lend support to the Paramaras than to bring virgin soil under cultivation.
para many chandela grounds also do not define the boundaries of the villages given this is especially true of grounds made before the 12th century 68 although some later grounds retain this form 69 The usual phrase used in the Chandela grounds is the same as in those of the Gaharwalas, namely, quote, the boundaries defined up to its, within bracket, of the village, four abattos, unquote, stop. A charter of Parmardin 1167 refers to the grant of probably 62 and certainly 11 villages, but does not specify their boundaries, 70. The boundaries and the yield are, however, mentioned in the grant of a plot of land made by Mother Navarman in 1134, 71. The boundaries and measurements of the donated land are also provided by the Mehoba, M-A-H-O-B-A plate of Parmardin, 1173. Thus, it would appear that the Chandelas preferred to define the boundaries if the object of grant was a plot of land, but did not do so if it was a village. By and large, the Chandela grants opened up avenues for the expansion of the donies in the neighborhood of the donated villages. Page 192 Para, the conditions seem to have been entirely different in Gujarat. whether chalukyas ruled perhaps the practice of not defining the boundaries of the village given in grant was followed in the last quarter of the 10th century in the reign of mula raja 72 the limits of a village granted by a chehmana feudatory of ajaypala in 1175 for feeding 50 brahmanas were not defined 73 But the boundaries of a village granted by Bhima Deva the first seventy four, and of plots of land granted by Bhima Deva the second seventy five, and by some subordinate authority under him were demarcated seventy six. Most of these grants, however, belong to the thirteenth century. Thus, we get the impression that in Gujarat, in the late twelfth and in the thirteenth centuries, boundaries of the gift villages were recorded, a practice which seems to be in keeping with the developed economy of that region. But generally, the grants of the eleventh and twelfth centuries show that the boundaries of the villages were left undefined so that the donies could take advantage of the confusion to add to their landed property by appropriating the neighborhood land. Neighboring land. Para, the land grants of 11th and 12th centuries further helped the appropriation of land and its resources by individual donies. Some early Pala charters sought the formal consent of the vassals, officials and the village community in making grants of villages. But even this formality was given up in later Pala charters. Instead of giving their consent, they were now just informed, 77, although the old form was followed in the charters of the Chandras of Bangladesh, 78 and in a 13th century copper plate from south munger 79 the princes of uttar pradesh central india and gujarat however never cared to pay even formal attention to the wishes of the villagers whose headmen and leading inhabitants and occasionally whose cultivators were informed of the grant but never asked to give their formal consent to it This gives us some indication of the weakening of the rights of the village population over the resources belonging to the village. Para. In transferring agrarian rights to the beneficiaries, the land charters of the period follow the pattern set by the Pala and Pratihara land grants, but they enlarge the scope of the concessions, practically embracing all the resources belonging to the village. Of course, page 193. Of course, pasture ground, grassy land beyond it, mango and mahua trees, reservoirs of water, bushes and thickets, forests, barren land, low land, fertile land, land under occasional flood, etc., all continued to be transferred to the Doni as in earlier times. But some new items, differing according to the 
geography of the area were added. Thus, the charters from Bangladesh almost invariably donated betel nut and coconut 80, rarely mentioned in earlier charters. Trees must have now constituted an important source of income in cash to those who grew them. Further, sometimes the village was now transferred along with salt, S.A. Sa hyphen Lavana, 81, mentioned as salt mine, Sir Lavana Akara, in some grounds from Bihar and Bihar, 82, and Uttar Pradesh, 83, and Baghel Khan. How the surrender of these resources to the recipients affected the villagers in Bangladesh cannot be said, but it indicates the more complete control of the beneficiaries over the period producers of the village over the varied producers of the village. Para. Curiously enough, the grants from Bengal do not transfer fishing rights unless they are covered by the Doni's rights to tanks and other reservoirs of water. Was this a concession to the universal test of the people of that area for eating fish? But the Garwala grants specifically transferred the government rights to fisheries. Matsi Akara, 84. It is obvious that unlike the transfer of iron and salt mines, 85, which would not be found in every village, that of rights to fisheries would affect the inhabitants of many villages who were not free to carry on fishing because of the presence of the grantees. Para. The Chandila charters present the most elaborate list of the village and its products made over to the Donis. In addition to various kinds of trees and mines, they mention the transfer of kusuma, flowers producing saffron, sugarcane, cotton, and sana, hemp plants. 86. Some lists mention even animals such as deer and birds and animals. Aquatic animals, 87, which would naturally affect the villagers' rights to hunt and fish freely. Similarly, in some Sena grants and generally in the Chandela charters, 88, temples were also transferred to the recipients. Such temples may have been constructed by the communal efforts of the villagers who undoubtedly used them for communal purposes, but once allotted to the donies, the threat to the communal use of the temple, page 194, could not be ignored. Especially the Brahmana donies would find it difficult to resist the temptation to monopolize the offerings and endowments made to the deities.